New World released at the end of September, and it nearly broke Amazon Web Services. Despite multiple rounds of user testing, the game studio wasn't prepared for the volume of players they would see. This high demand resulted in long queue times, which forced Amazon Game Studios to bring more servers online. Once players were able to get into the game, players were met with a number of bugs. Of course, it isn't all bad. New World managed to see 1 million players in its first day, and at one point had 600,000 players online at the exact same time. In this video, I'm going to talk about the six things software engineers can learn from New World. Number one, progression loops are good. New World makes use of a number of progression loops to keep their players playing for hours at a time. The game has a traditional leveling system where players progress from level one, up to level 60. When leveling up, players get access to new quests and also unlock attribute points that can be spent to make their character stronger. While progressing, players can also level up 17 different trade skills, with each one maxing out at level 200. Similar to the core leveling experience, as you level up a trade skill, you unlock the ability to do more activities, whether that be gathering more expensive materials or crafting more powerful gear. Leveling up your character and their trade skills is fairly common in most MMOs. One area where New World differs is the game's lack of a class system. When creating your character, you don't decide if you'll be a mage, priest, paladin, warrior, or rogue. Instead, you customize how your character looks, and then you get on with playing the game. Every weapon in the game has its own progression loop. As you use the weapon, you'll gain experience for that weapon, which lets you add new abilities specific to that weapon type. There are currently 12 weapons, but more are expected to be added as new content is released. Another way players can progress in the game is through increasing their territory standing. New World consists of several different territories, and as players explore these territories, their standing will increase. Currently, players can have a maximum standing of 300 in each territory, and every time they rank up, they unlock a new bonus. Along with increasing their individual standing, players can also take control over these territories with their company. When a company takes control of a territory, they effectively take over how that territory will progress. The controlling company is able to level up their fort, which is where wars take place to determine who will control the territory. They also unlock the ability to level up the different crafting stations along with setting property, crafting, and trade taxes. Slight tangent, but is it weird that a game created by Jeff Bezos' company forces players to pay taxes? Let me know in the comments. We only scratched the surface on the different ways players can progress in New World. These systems are in place to keep players interested in the game. If you work on game development full time, these systems are fairly easy to port over into your own game. However, if you are working on a SaaS product, you can still learn a lot from this game. Find opportunities to show your customers how they are progressing with your product. Oftentimes, this can be done by surfacing analytics to your users. You can also make use of push notifications or thoughtful email marketing to let your customers know how far they have come. Number two. Deadlines can be harmful. New World was originally set for release in May 2020, but ended up being delayed four times and finally released September 28th, 2021. These delays were not bad things. They actually helped to improve the game in many different ways, which we'll discuss later on in this video. The main issue is that it's impossible to predict when something will be ready to go live to customers. During every phase of testing, Amazon Game Studios gathered more data about how their players were playing the game. With this new data, the studio made changes to the game to make sure it was more enjoyable to a wider audience. Of course, as with anything, changes do not come for free. Ideally, you want to measure twice and cut once as these changes did push back the release date by over a year. What's even more challenging is the game originally focused on being PvP only. During testing, they uncovered that enough players misused the always-on PvP system and ruined the experience for lower level players. That's when the game pivoted from only PvP to being a hybrid MMO featuring both PvP and PvE content. The problem was the game didn't have very compelling PvE content, especially when it came to the end game, which if you're new to MMOs, that is basically the start of the game. Not only did the studio have to pivot on how PvP worked at a fundamental level, they also had to create brand new PvE content that was never planned for. The end result was a game that was delayed four times, and when it finally did release, it still felt unfinished. This isn't a dig at the developers at Amazon Game Studios. Given the salary and benefits of the company, I can only imagine they're hiring the best and brightest game developers. This is, however, criticism of how deadlines are used in tech. Oftentimes, deadlines are decided on without much input from the development team. At the time these arbitrary deadlines are created, there isn't enough information about what the finished product will look like. If you find yourself in a deadline-driven culture, 
there are some things you can do to correct this behavior. The first thing is to ask your product manager to involve you and the rest of the development team earlier on. Ideally, this would be during the ideation process. During this process, the team can provide t-shirt sizes for the work. The expectation for these estimates is that they will be less and less precise the larger and larger the t-shirt becomes. The second thing to do is to use deadlines to your advantage. New World could have released the game in May of 2020. Would it have been released as a full game? Probably not. New World could have been released in early access though. The diehard fans could have gotten the game sooner, while the less enthusiastic fans could wait until the game came out of early access. If, however, you are working against a fixed deadline, then the scope of work must be flexible. In this situation, you would prioritize only the most important functionality for a feature. The volume of work doesn't change, but when you work on certain features would. When it comes to normal software products, not video games, it's better to release the minimum working product in three months or less, and then iterate on that based on customer feedback. Number three, client-side validation is not the answer. Client-side validation was one of the biggest mistakes that New World made. This design decision led to players being able to duplicate their items, which forced Amazon to take the auction house offline for several days while also preventing players from exchanging coin with others. While this mistake may seem careless, it's one that I've unfortunately seen quite a few times. When it comes down to deciding where certain logic should live, it is oftentimes faster to handle it client side. This isn't because it takes less time. In fact, client side validation is typically duplicated across web, iOS, and Android clients. It's faster because there aren't enough engineers working on the backend API, which means you are always fighting against competing priorities for backend work. This isn't true at every company, and it may not even be true in the case of New World. However, this is typically why client-side validation makes it into production systems. One solution that can work out pretty well is having a middle layer between backend services and the front-end clients. This middle layer could make use of GraphQL, and it could be written in either JavaScript or Kotlin to allow for web or mobile developers to easily make changes. By doing this, clients only need to worry about rendering what the server provides back to them. Of course, this doesn't come without downsides. Being reliant on the server makes it more difficult to create offline experiences. It can also make latency sensitive tasks like playing a video game less enjoyable if the response times are too slow. These downsides are almost always worth the upsides. Number four. Listen to your customers. In October of 2018, Amazon Game Studios started a closed alpha that ran until June of 2019. During this alpha, they were able to gather plenty of useful customer feedback and it ended up changing the direction of the entire game. New World was originally a game where PvP was always turned on. This created a system where you'd want to find some other players to party up with to take out lower level or higher level solo players. Amazon Game Studios went back to the drawing board and came up with a new PvP system where both players had to opt into PvP. I am confident that the game will continue to adapt. The reason I am confident is because they're releasing weekly patches. These patches generally move the game two steps forward by fixing bugs and adding content, and then one step backwards because these changes always introduce new bugs. We'll talk about how Amazon can avoid these bugs later on in the video. With your own work, you should ask yourself why you are building a product. Are you building a product for yourself or are you building it to sell to others? If you are building it for yourself, then this next part probably doesn't apply to you. If you're building the product to sell to others though, then you should probably get feedback from your customers. The lowest effort way of doing this is to track events to understand your user's behavior. From these events, you can get a better sense for how your customers are using your product. This requires no effort on the part of your customers and for the most part, these events are ones you'd want to keep track of anyway. The downside is you have to infer how your customers perceive your product. The next way to get feedback is to create surveys for your customers. These are ideally baked into the product and can be completed in under 60 seconds. Having surveys longer than that, and you have to worry about your customers ignoring the survey. These surveys can help you understand how your customers might perceive a certain feature within your product. The final way is to talk to the customer directly. This this takes a lot of time and effort as you'll usually meet with the customer for 30 minutes to talk about their experience. Also, finding someone that wants to take 30 minutes out of their own busy day can be challenging. Nonetheless, these interactions can help you understand what your customer is trying to do and whether or not the product works for them. None of these things matter if you don't have a product that your customers can use. This is why it's important to focus on releasing MVPs 
that offer a core experience and nothing more. From there, you can gather customer feedback while adding additional features to that core experience. Number five, don't make assumptions. This video has been full of assumptions. I've never worked for Amazon Game Studios, and I've looked at exactly zero lines of code for New World. The lessons learned are still applicable, although it doesn't mean that the developers made these mistakes unintentionally or did things correctly on purpose. I have no idea, only the developers at Amazon do. The same can be said when you start working at a new company or switch teams and are now working on a different set of repositories. The poor design decisions might have been done because the code author had no clue what they were doing. What's more likely though, is that they had a deadline and good enough was better than perfect. This person probably has a life outside of work as well, so the idea of working extra unpaid overtime probably wasn't appealing to them. It's also perfectly reasonable that the poorly written code you're upset over was written by someone inexperienced. This person may have been thrown into the deep end on a project and they just focused on making it work instead of worrying about how easy it will be to maintain. That person would likely dislike that code today as well. It's easy to assume that perfect code is a given and anything else is laziness. Even though code is executed by machines, it is written by people. Without those people, it's difficult to have the necessary context about the code. This is why I try to over communicate my intentions in commit messages. If nothing else, hopefully the git blame that points to my name is helpful. However, unless you talk to the person that wrote the code, you'll never have the full story. So don't dwell on it and just assume the person was doing their best given the circumstances. Number six, quality assurance is everyone's job. It's great to release new features and fix bugs, but it is defeating when those updates introduce additional bugs in the process. Currently, Amazon has been moving two steps forward with bug fixes and content updates, but they're moving one step backwards in these weekly patches as they introduce new bugs. Ultimately, quality assurance is an issue and this is an issue where we can all learn something. Nothing can ever replace manual testing, especially when that testing is exploratory to find new bugs. One process that I've seen work well at a number of companies I've worked at is to have at least one software engineer test a pull request before the code can be merged. It hopefully goes without saying, but the software engineer testing this code is not the same one that wrote the code. The code author should have already tested their own work before opening a pull request. Another aspect of manual testing that has worked well for me in the past is to have bug bashes or testing parties. This can be done prior to releasing a large feature that spanned multiple sprints, or it can be done on a regular basis to find bugs throughout the product. The format I like the most is to block out one or two days to allow the team to test the application. As bugs are found, those are logged and then immediately fixed. The goal is to not find new bugs, but also to fix as many as possible. Manual testing will only get you so far. It is best to rely on automated tests for the bulk of your quality assurance needs. The most difficult automated tests you can write are end-to-end -end tests. These involve testing an entire user flow without mocking any data. Oftentimes, you'll want to have a dedicated testing environment where these can run along with automated systems in place for setting up data to be in the correct state for a given test. It's easy to introduce flaky tests here and failures don't always mean something is wrong. When possible, it's best to have a dedicated test engineering team in place to author and maintain your end-to-end -end tests. Moving on to slightly easier tests to write, we have integration tests. These tests exist to validate that multiple multiple parts of your code base work together correctly. Oftentimes, these will rely on mocks to make writing the tests easier. Having mocks in place will also make the tests run more consistently, so when a test fails, you'll have more confidence something is actually wrong. I tend to use integration tests to validate the user experience works as expected, while mocking the network layer to remove the chance of flaky tests from unexpected changes to the system. Then, moving on to the easiest test to write, we have unit tests. These rely heavily on mock data, and you'll probably end up with thousands of these if you're doing it right. Another nice part about unit tests is as you find new bugs, you can easily write tests to replicate the bug. At that point, you should see the test failing. Then you would update your code to fix the bug, and at that point, you would see the newly added test passing. These unit tests will also run incredibly fast because they're only executing a small amount of code in isolation. I made an entire video dedicated to how I write good unit tests. If you want to get a head start on writing applications devoid of bugs, then I'd strongly recommend you go check out that video on unit testing right now. If you enjoyed this video, feel free to smash the like button.